Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sophie Abrams, and my capstone is titled Closing the Loop on the Thimble Farm Slaughterhouse, a Waste Composting Feasibility Study. I was born and raised on the island of Martha's Vineyard. If anyone's ever been to Martha's Vineyard, or if maybe you've heard about Martha's Vineyard, you might already be picturing the pristine sandy beaches and the quaint New England towns. Or you could be picturing Bill Clinton and President Obama golfing and vacationing with their families. Or James Taylor and Carly Simon <laughs> singing on a summer night. <laughs> or you could be thinking about the great white shark Jaws who swam his way to Hollywood fame. <laughs> In reality, yes, the vineyard is home to all of those things. But this small island of about 26 miles across, off the coast of Massachusetts, is also home to 20,000 year-round residents who make the island what it is. These are construction workers, landscapers, people cleaning those pools for the presidents to swim in. And it's a place that has a rich history in whaling, fishing, and agriculture. The heyday of the agriculture movement on the island was between 1900 and 1950, when half of the land was farmed for food. That began to decline in the 60s, but there's been a recent resurgence of farming on the island. For my capstone project, I worked with the nonprofit organization Island Grown Initiative. For the rest of this project, I'll refer to as IGI. IGI's mission is to increase the supply and demand of local food, and they do this through various programs. They have Island Grown Poultry, where they created a mobile chicken processor, so we have local chicken. Island Grown Bees, where they ensure the honey bee health on the vineyard. And until recently, their largest program was Island Grown Schools. So they've built gardens at all of the schools, as you can see. They do garden education as part of the science curriculum, and they've brought more local and healthy foods to the school lunch program. A friend of mine works for Island Grown Schools, and one night over dinner we were talking and I was voicing my frustrations about the fact that there is no composting operation at all on the island. If your food is not going in a backyard compost, then it's going into the trash where it's being shipped off the island to a landfill somewhere. She got really excited, and she was like, oh my god, Soph, this is so great. So IGI just got a farm, Thimble Farm, and they're going to be doing composting stuff there. Let me get you in touch with the president. So the president, Sarah McKay, invited me to come to the first composting planning meeting. At that meeting, I learned that IGI's master plan for Thimble Farm is to construct a humane slaughterhouse. This is great for the island farming community. It saves the farmers the extra cost of shipping their animals off-island. It saves the animals the traumatic journey off-island. And it saves the extra fossil fuels in transporting these animals long distances. But a slaughterhouse comes with its own complications and challenges. One of them is the need to process the waste. So about 65% of the animal's live weight that goes to the slaughterhouse goes back with the farmer. The other 35% is left as waste. And this can be difficult to dispose of, especially since we don't have a composting operation. And if done improperly, it can also pose great environmental risks. So the problem with that is that in order, oh, so IGI actually decided that they, that it would make the most sense to actually process their waste on site. And the complication with that is that they need a large amount of carbon materials to do this. So carbon materials are things like wood chips, hay, sawdust, etc. And these get mixed with the nitrogen-rich animal remains to create compost. So Keith Wilda, the manager of the IGI farm, said he has no idea if there, were, if there are enough resources available on the island for them to actually carry out this operation. He said the solution would be to conduct a feasibility study. But he said the problem with that is that they don't have the time or resources to do it. He said what they needed to know is are there enough of these resources on the island? Are they available to IGI? And if so, at what cost? I'd been, I told them about this capstone project that I had coming up and said I really wanted to be doing something that could give something back to my community and my passion for local food, hopefully do something to combine that. And they asked me if I would do this feasibility study. So I was in. Perfect. 
So I was really excited. I get home. I'm like, I have a capstone. Like, I might really graduate. This is so great. Um, I was telling everyone about it. And then people are like, oh, cool. How are you going to go about finding that information out? And that's when the panic set in. <laughs> because I knew I had to get this information, and I had no clue how I was going to do it. So I talked to some people. I called Sarah and Keith, and I was like, we got to have a meeting. So we sat down together, and we looked at the project, looked at how it would go, and decided the best way to find out this information would be through a survey. So I created a survey on SurveyMonkey that was very simple and would hopefully just get us exactly the data that we needed. With that, I had to create a detailed contact list and identify all the businesses on the island that might have carbon materials as waste from their business. So companies like landscaping companies, tree companies, construction companies, horse farms, golf courses, etc. Then, I created the survey, the contacts, I sent out the survey. And I figured this next part is going to be a breeze. I'm going to sit back in my chair and relax, and these responses are just going to come rolling in. Because, I mean, people really care about this issue. I figured out, like, 50 responses, I would have to cut it off and start looking at the data I had, put it into a beautiful report and presentation for the client. Well, I could not have been more wrong. <laughs> the first bump in the road in my project came when I realized nobody wants to fill out an email survey. <laughs> and especially on Martha's Vineyard in the spring and summer. <laughs> so, the first thing I did was again call the client. We had another meeting and I said, you guys, I'm having a really hard time getting responses. And they were like, well, yeah, of course you are. We're like, that is not a surprise. So the first thing that we did was to set a realistic expectation. Sarah suggested, try to get 30 responses. That's a good sample size. And then you can, you know, close that part of the project and move on. Otherwise, this is going to go on forever. But even with these new realistic expectations, I had a long way to go. I had sent out the survey to 85 people, and I got five responses. So I tried some new tactics. I sent out reminder emails every week because I know from my own experience that if I get the same survey three or four times, I, like, I might get curious and open it up eventually. <laughs> and that kept working, but very slowly. And then the next part is where I got to put my fearless leadership skills to the test. I printed out the survey and I started shopping it around to businesses. And this was really scary for me at first because I felt kind of lame bringing this survey in to these businesses that I knew everyone was so busy and I'm asking them to take time to do this. But eventually I realized, like, this is a really important project. And so I got over that. And this part ended up being the most fulfilling. I was out in the community making relationships for IGI. I got to gauge community interest on the project. And it ended up being a lot of fun. I also got a little, when that got very time consuming, I got a little aggressive with my networks, my family, my friends, my colleagues, and really just tried to find any point of contact at any of these businesses to get that survey into somebody's hands. And in the end, I ended up collecting 27 survey responses. So I almost made it to that goal. And at that point, I was like running into some deadlines with the, on the project side of things. So I was like, I'm going to cut this off and start looking at what I found. So the first thing to do was look at what IGI actually needs. This is IGI's composting recipe. And all these materials are going to be coming from the farm's own operations, except for the three that I circled in red. So what this says is that IGI needs 160 yards of wood chips per year, 160 yards of leaves and other dry landscaping debris, and 80 yards per year of sawdust in order to run the composting operations. And this is what I found. So this is the table that I presented to the client last week. It has the materials reported, it has the response rate, and then I use that to estimate the total materials that might be available. <clears throat> For the purposes of this presentation, I'm just going to show you what was actually reported, which is the larger part on top. What I found is that there are almost 2,000 yards per year of wood chips available, about 1,500 yards of leaves, and 40 yards per year of sawdust. So to look at this another way, the purple bars are the quantities needed for my, by IGI. The green are the quantities available. And so it looks pretty good, most of this. The wood chips, the leaves, there's 10 times the amount that they need. And they had no idea what I was going to show them on this graph, so they were thrilled about that. But then we look over at the sawdust category. My father owns a construction company, and knowing how many building companies are on the island, this was pretty shocking. 
So I went back to my results, and I saw that my father's company was actually the one that reported having the most amount of sawdust. So I went and talked to them. I was like, where's the sawdust coming from? How come no one else has any? And what we realized is that all the sawdust was coming from the woodworking shop. They build houses, but they also make cabinets and furniture. The companies I'd been surveying were construction companies that are out in the field building houses. They're not actually the ones that create sawdust. It's coming from boat builders, furniture makers, and other indoor wood shops. So just last week, I realized that all the construction companies I had surveyed were actually not the right audience to be talking to. So this was a little bit disappointing so late in the game. I didn't have time to go back and survey um, wood, the wood shops, but it's also a great opportunity for IGI moving forward. And they can go in and fill in that gap. And it, just having that information left myself and the client confident that once we're talking to the right people, there will be plenty of this resource. So the next part was to look at the availability. This meant, one of the questions on my survey was if people reported materials, it was would you donate these materials to IGI? Would you sell them and at what cost or neither of those things and why? So I was able to actually put a dollar amount on what these materials would cost for IGI so that they can you know, pr plan for that and forecast a little bit in their budget for the, for the composting operations. I'm not gonna go into too much detail about that here, but I will share one really cool discovery. So, and a couple other cool discoveries. A lot of the horse farms have manure, those are mixed with bedding, so it falls under the wood chip category. They were all really happy to donate that. They don't really have another way to dispose of it. And the landscaping companies reported tons of leaves and other materials, and they all were willing to sell those materials. But the coolest thing was one of the restaurants on the island reported throwing 20 pounds of peanut shells in the trash every day. <laughs> that fits under the sawdust category in terms of the recipe we looked at, and they said they'd be happy to donate these materials through IGI, to IGI. So through looking at the availability, I had to make some cool discoveries like that. And the last part was giving recommendations to the client for the next steps. This is just the first stage in this project, and as the, op the composting operations become closer to being operational, there's going to be a lot more to do. So my first recommendation was to continue the data collection. Go back and survey those wood shops and go back at a slower time of year to talk to some of the companies that I talked to that were just like, yeah, yeah, I'll fill it out tomorrow, and then like, just couldn't get a hold of them for the rest of the summer. The second is to follow up with the businesses who did say that they had materials either to sell or donate. Keeping these relationships going with them now will really help when it's time to open the slaughterhouse and they need to have these materials ready to go. The third is to acquire their own vehicle. A lot of businesses said, yeah, we'll donate materials, but we have no way to get them to you. So that'll make it really easy to go around, pick everything up, do it in an organized way. The next is community outreach. A lot of the businesses that I talked to face-to-face -to -face were really excited about this, and they, some of them hadn't heard about this. They didn't know that the slaughterhouse was going to be composting its own waste, and they, were, they wanted to make sure that the whole community actually knows that this is going to be happening. So a write-up in the paper or another way to get that information out there. The next is to have a composting champion at IGI. Keith is, he operates the entire farm and they have a lot in that master plan and he's going to be wearing a lot of different hats. So to have one person that has the time and the energy to devote to this. And the last is community value. Looking beyond IGI, we found such an excess in these resources that they can have big Im implications, not just for IGI's operations, but for other composting operations on the island as well. So I have to give a big thanks to Sarah and Keith, even though they're not here. It was really great to work with their organization, and they were really happy with the results and asked if I would be interested in working on some of the next stages of this project, which is really exciting. And being able to do a project like this, one where we broke some new ground, found out new information, and found out information that is going to have lasting implications for the island's waste management and local food systems is everything I ever could have hoped for in my capstone experience. So thanks IGI, thank you Marlboro for the skills to help me do this project, and thanks to all of you for coming.